This video is to give an example of how you would give a presentation using PowerPoint to report your results from an experiment. So I'm going to quickly go through some research I've done in the past as an example. And then at the end, I'll come back and point out a couple of things that are different between giving a presentation um, versus writing up a research report on your experiment. So I'm going to talk about the independent project I did looking at the effects of atrazine, which is a weed killer, on development in the African claw-toed frog, also known as Xenopus labus. So you may wonder why I chose the weed killer atrazine. And this is a map of the United States looking at atrazine use in 2004 that I got from the EPA. And so this fuchsia magenta color in the middle is showing where atrazine is used at higher levels. So you can see it's used a lot in agriculture in the Midwest. And atrazine is a pre-emergent herbicide. That means it's applied early in the growing season to prevent growth of weeds early on. But you can imagine if you're spraying atrazine on a field when there's very little vegetation and then you have a strong rain event, that the runoff from that field would have a higher level of atrazine concentration because it would wash it off the field. And atrazine is really persistent in the environment. So atrazine, the herbicide, was developed nearly 50 years ago. And in Europe, they've outlawed its use, but it got into the groundwater where it's protected from the sun and things like that. And so you can still find it in the groundwater in Europe, even though it hasn't been used in about 15 years. So atrazine is applied in the springtime. And this is the time when a lot of amphibians are mating and laying eggs in bodies of water. And these bodies of water are sometimes vernal ponds. And so these vernal ponds are seasonal. So they're only there in the spring when you have more rain. And so it's possible that these vernal ponds could have higher levels of atrazine during times when amphibian embryos are undergoing really quick developmental processes. And so I wanted to know if atrazine could affect development in those organisms. Previous studies indicate that it could, the atrazine could cause problems with amphibian development. So for example, a couple of studies reported that with atrazine exposure, you see increased incidence of edemas, which are fluid-filled um, cavities, which I'll have some images of in a minute. Um, you increase gut defects and increase tail defects. Um, additionally, another study reported that there was abnormal swimming in tadpoles that had been exposed to atrazine during development. So I wanted to follow up on these and look more carefully using um, Xenophis labus, which is a model system for development. So this is the life cycle of Xenophis. Up here in the left corner, you have fertilization. And then as we know, early cleavage stages, gastrulation, neurulation, and then organ morphogenesis or organogenesis. So this is the period of time in development when tadpoles have organs, but they're very simple and they're undergoing morphological changes. So they're changing shape. Um, and there's a lot of migration of tissues and further differentiation to make a mature organ. In Xenophis, this is a standardized uh, staging system that's numbered from 0 to 46. And organ morphogenesis occurs largely between stages 40 and 46. So these were the stages I was interested in looking at. And 40 Stage 40 is at about two and a half days post-fertilization, and stage 46 is at about four and a half days post-fertilization. So I was interested in exposing tadpoles to atrazine for this approximately two-day period. And my hypothesis was that atrazine exposure during organ morphogenesis will cause increased incidence of malformation. So how I did this was I collected Xenophis embryos, and I waited until they reached stage 40. And then I exposed embryos to different concentrations of atrazine. And then when the controls that weren't exposed to atrazine reached stage 46, I scored all of the embryos for any malformations that I might see. And these are examples of malformations that I counted. So this is a normal control um, Xenophis tadpole at stage 46. So these are the intestines. This is the eye, this is the cloaca, and you can see the axis is nice, long, and straight. And in tadpoles that were exposed to atrazine, you can see the axis is severely reduced. The tail is malformed. This is the edema I mentioned, so these large um, blister-like areas of the tadpole. 
And you can see the intestine looks very different as well. But to look carefully at intestinal malformations, what I examined was in a normal tadpole, this is a well-established pattern where the uh, gut coils in a counterclockwise fashion and makes this nice little coil. But in tadpoles that were exposed to atrazine, the intestine would often have this uh, straighter, non-coiled form. And so I counted how frequently that happened when they were exposed to atrazine as well. So these are my data, and I just want to orient you to this figure. So on the y-axis are the percent of the embryos I counted that had certain malformations. And the number of embryos I counted is indicated above each of these sets of bars. On the x-axis are the treatments. So this is my control treatment that did not get exposed to atrazine. And then I tested a range of atrazine concentrations from 0.535 milligrams per liter all the way up to 35 milligrams per liter. And I chose these concentrations based on previous studies as well as reported concentrations of atrazine um, in runoff from agricultural fields. The light gray bars are to indicate how many malformed intestines, and the dark gray bars are to indicate how many uh, embryos had edemas. And then I have images of those two malformations up in the corner to remind you of what they looked like. So you'll notice that in the control treatment, very few Xenopus embryos exhibited malformations um, of either type after this window of development. And then there was a dose response of malformed intestines to concentration of atrazine. So with increased atrazine concentration, the incidence of gut malformations went from about 10% of the embryos to nearly 100% of the embryos I examined. And similarly, with the incidence of edema, I also saw a dose response in that, although it wasn't quite as steep through 10 milligrams per liter as the intestinal malformations, but it did reach nearly 100% as well in the highest concentration of atrazine. So a quick summary of these data are that tadpoles exposed to the herbicide atrazine during organ morphogenesis exhibit increased malformations. And so I started thinking about possible explanations for why this might be and some follow-up experiments that could be done. So my first question is, what are the reasons for these malformations? So one idea I came up with is that maybe it's due to cell death. So cell death or apoptosis increases at metamorphosis. So we all know that normally a tadpole tail disappears when it metamorphoses into a frog, and that's due to actual death of cells. So maybe I'm starting these metamorphic processes too early in tadpoles, so we, maybe there's increased cell death. There are enzymes that are also associated with metamorphosis that maybe those are contributing to these malformations. So these enzymes, called matrix metalloproteinases, break down the matrix around cells in tissues, and those also increase at metamorphosis. So if those have more, if we have more of that enzyme in the tissue, you could imagine how you'd end up with a shorter axis and malformed intestines. So it'd be interesting to look at genes that are associated with metamorphosis to see if atrazine exposure increases their expression and maybe contributes to these observations I've made. And that is my presentation. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna run back to the first section. <clears throat> so note that I, in my presentation, just like you would in a lab report, you have a full descriptive title that includes important information about the dependent and independent variables you're examining. So in this case, I was looking at atrazine. So the concentration of atrazine was my independent variable and development was my dependent variable. So it's examining development. And I include both the common and the scientific name of the organism I use. So when I gave background about my project, notice that I have very little writing on my slide. And when I was speaking about this background, I elaborated on the information I presented in the PowerPoint. And this is really important because if you just have paragraphs of text, people will not listen to what you're saying and they won't really think about your project or the background of your project. It's always good to have visuals to illustrate 
your ideas, hence the map, and you should always include citations using the author name and year of any information you're including here so that people know where they could look for the information if they're interested in following up on that background. So when I talked about how I approached my project, again, I used schematics, but I talked about them so that people could listen to what I'm saying and match it up with the images. And that really helps people understand your project and think about it while you're presenting. I had a clear hypothesis I was testing. This slide may even be more interesting if I included some schematic or image that would help um, exhibit what I'm proposing to test. And then when I talked about my materials and methods, again, minimal writing, so it's good to give an outline of your project. Some people will do a schematic or a flowchart that gives the basic um, overview of the project, and then you can include more details when you're presenting. So when you include figures in a presentation, you don't include the figure legend, you don't include a figure heading. So in this case, I say, what the graph is showing. So atrazine exposure increases malformations. So now I know what I'm supposed to look for in the data in this figure. And the information I normally include in a figure legend, such as the number of embryos I looked at or the treatment that I used, I talked about, right? So I pointed out that this was what the y-axis and the x-axis represented. I pointed out that these numbers are the number of embryos I counted. And then verbally, I spoke about what I might write in a results section. So I recognize that there was a dose response to atrazine exposure. There's an increase in malformations with increased atrazine concentration. So just like when you're writing a research report, you want to point out these important trends that you notice in your data for the reader to think about. And in this case, for the audience to think about. And then you want a quick summary of your study. So sometimes your study has really obvious results, and sometimes your study may not, but it's really important to bring it all back together at the end to let the audience know what they should really be taking away from your research. And importantly, to propose next steps you may take. So this is the equivalent of a discussion in a lab report. So you come up with possible explanations for why you saw what you did, or maybe why you didn't see something. And then ideas for what you could follow up on. So I noticed there were definitely increased malformations in Xenopus embryos that had been exposed to atrazine. And so I'd be really curious to look and see if there are any genes that change expression due to atrazine exposure that could explain those malformations. And so this would give me a good idea of what next steps I could take. And it would uh, make the audience more curious about where I was going with this research. And then it's always nice at the end to thank anybody who is involved and to, an opportunity to take questions as well. <laughs>